Thank you all for coming to the third of our uh, seminars in the Neuroethics Seminar Series. My name is Toss Cochran. I'm the Director of Neuroethics at the Center for Bioethics. And in a moment, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, David Fisher, who is, the, is responsible for organizing uh, the seminar tonight called Hacking the Brain Neuroenhancement with, neuro, with Non-Invasive Brain Stimulation. Um, but first, I'd just like to take a moment to uh, thank our partners who are helping to fund the endeavor. Uh, and they include the Harvard Brain Initiative, uh, the Harvard Society for Mind, Brain, and Behavior, and the International Neuroethics Society. The uh, International Neuroethics Society is uh, specifically supporting our ability to webcast this tonight, and we'd like to thank them for that support. Um, and during the Q&A uh, segment tonight, I'll be monitoring the Twitter feed. Uh, the handle is at HMS Bioethics. Um, and anybody who's watching via webcast can uh, tweet at that handle. I'll be monitoring it. And if you've got a question, I will try and get it included in the Q&A session. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, David Fisher, who is um, a senior HMS student who has, is responsible for the talks we're going to see tonight. Thank you, Dr. Cochran. So I'm, uh, I'm David. I'm a medical student here at Harvard. And um, thank you for coming to this, or streaming online, this uh, seminar on neuroenhancement and non-invasive brain stimulation. Uh, as Dr. Cochran said, this was uh, made possible by several groups, including those listed here. Um, and we're accompanied today by several great panelists. Um, uh, and I just want to take a moment to briefly introduce each of them. So the first is Dr. Alvaro Pasquale Leone. Uh, he's a neurologist at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, where he's also the director for uh, the Berenson Allen Center for Non-Invasive Brain Stimulation. He's also the associate dean for clinical and translational research at Harvard Medical School. And he's a world leader in the field of non-invasive brain stimulation. He's published several, over 900 uh, scientific articles on the subject matter, uh, several books and his focus is on the application of non-invasive brain stimulation in healthy individuals and in disease to study uh, brain plasticity, for example. Uh, our second panelist is uh, Mr. Hank Greeley. He's a law professor at Stanford Law School. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Law and the Biosciences uh, and of the Stanford Interdisciplinary Group on Neuroscience and Society. He specializes in the ethical, legal, social implications of uh, biomedical technologies and has in recently developed an interest in non-invasive brain stimulation asking questions about regulation, uh, safety, and the ethical application of these new technologies. And thirdly, we have uh, Dr. Jamie Tyler, who's the co-founder and chief science officer of Think, uh, a company that manufactures um, stimulation devices that are uh, designed to uh, modulate mood. Uh, he has a research interest in uh, brain modulation and has helped to develop much of the technology that Think, the Think device uses. Uh, he's also an associate professor in the School of Biological and Health Systems Engineering at Arizona State University. Um, so really, you're here to uh, hear these panelists talk, but I just want to say a few brief words about what neuroenhancement is and what non-invasive brain stimulation is. So neuroenhancement, in the most general uh, possible kind of conception, is the improvement of brain functions, such as cognition and mood, in healthy individuals, in contrast to, say, the treatment of uh, disease. Um, and this is the question of neuroenhancement or uh, cosmetic neurology has come up now for many years, uh, but has recently started targeting this issue of non-invasive brain stimulation as opposed to, say, drugs. And when we talk about non-invasive brain stimulation, there's two major forms that we typically talk about. Uh, the first is transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. And the way that works is a uh, plastic device is applied to the, the scalp. And within that plastic device is a metal coil of wires. And when you pass a very strong electrical current through those wires, what you do is you generate a magnetic field that magnetic field passes into the brain and can activate neurons within a particular part of the brain. Based on the configuration of those coils within that plastic device, you can actually uh, uh, folk, uh, kind of intensify that magnetic field in a particular region of the brain. And so you can really have pretty focal effects on the brain using TMS. But these TMS devices cost tens of thousands of dollars. It's not like anyone can go out and just buy their own TMS device. And so recently, attention has started turning to an alternative form of non-invasive brain stimulation called transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS. 
Uh, the way this works is you apply electrodes to the scalp and pass a very weak electrical current from one to the other. There is a positively charged electrode, or anode, and a negatively charged electrode, or cathode. And the way this is thought to work is that a portion of that electrical current is thought to pass through the brain, and the positively charged electrode, or the anode, is thought to increase the excitability of the underlying brain, whereas the negatively charged electrode, or the cathode, is thought to suppress excitability of the underlying brain. And TDCS has been studied in lots of different uh, cognitive functions, and there's been lots of evidence to suggest that you can actually enhance lots of different human functions, brain functions, with TDCS, including language, attention, learning, and memory, um, many different things. And because of this, it's garnered a lot of media attention, the New York Times calling it a jump starter kit from the mind, as well as the Atlantic and the New Yorker. And also, uh, companies have also taken advantage, creating their own commercial devices that anyone can just go out and buy uh, for their own enhancement, uh, for gaming or uh, endurance athletes. And Dr. Jamie Tyler will talk a little bit about uh, a device that he's helped come up with to modulate mood. Also, because a lot of the components of TDCS are cheap, you can essentially construct your own device for un under $100. There's been this emerging community that's just taking it upon themselves to do it themselves. Um, and so there are examples of these online communities sharing tips about how to stimulate your brain, the configurations of the, elect of the electrodes necessary to improve memory or attention, and also trading tips on safety. So uh, before we had the seminar, I also passed around a survey to kind of assess what people's attitudes were towards neuroenhancement with TDCS. These were eight cases, which I'll go through briefly. And I told people who responded to this survey that TDCS is the uh, passage of a weak electrical current through scalp electrodes, and that there's some evidence to suggest that you can improve attention with TDCS. Um, and I've also, I also said that TDCS, when it's applied correctly and with appropriate current levels, is relatively safe. And I asked respondents to rate the appropriateness of each case. So we had 131 respondents total. Um, about 45% have tried TDCS before, 55% hadn't. Granted, this was not an unbiased sample. These were people who were interested in non-invasive brain stimulation. And I also circulated it among these online do-it-yourself communities. Of those who have had tr tried uh, TDCS before, um, uh, about 20% of them were uh, acquired from a company. About 10% of them uh, built it personally or acquired it from a research study. Uh, this computer's struggling a little bit right now. Let's see. These are, yes, this is, these are all cases of TDCS. No, I'm a <laughs> <laughs> the mouse is going rogue. Okay, so, so there were eight cases. They were all cases of TDCS, um, and there were two sets of cases. So in the first four, they, they were all about this 20-year-old college student who wanted TDCS to improve attention. And in the first set of cases, he wanted it for different reasons. In the first case, he had ADHD and wanted treatment. In the second, he wanted it for a final exam. In the third, he wanted to be at the top of his class. And in the fourth, he wanted to be the best at gaming among his friends. Um, and in the second set, uh, he wanted it for, he wanted TDCS for attention for school, but either acquired the TDCS device from a doctor, from a research uh, study, from a company, or built it himself. So I, I separated respondents into those who uh, have not had TDCS and those who have had TDCS. And for ADHD treatment, uh, there was a general uh, consensus that this was typically appropriate, um, particularly so among those who have had TDCS experience in the past. 
For, those, for uh, the case where the student wanted it for a final exam, both groups were a little bit less enthusiastic about this. Um, and the subjects who have not had TDCS experience actually reversed their opinion, thinking in general this was more inappropriate. When it comes to being the best in school, um, those without TDCS think it's even less appropriate. Um, and uh, those with TDCS experience still think it's generally appropriate, although less so. And then lastly, when it comes to gaming, uh, responding, uh, respondents without TDCS experience thought this was the least appropriate scenario, um, and the resp respondents with TDCS experience thought it was still appropriate, but of, of them uh, less appropriate, for example, than, than treatment. When it comes to where they got the TDCS devices from, uh, when it comes to getting it from a doctor, uh, both groups, again, thought it was generally appropriate, especially those who have had TDCS experience. When it comes to getting it from a, a research study, uh, both groups still generally thought that this was appropriate, uh, an appropriate place to get TDCS from, although those who had the TDCS experience, again, were more positive about this. And when it came from, to getting it from a company, uh, those, uh, both groups were less positive about this, but the, the respondents who had no TDCS experience showed a reversal of their opinions. They now, in general, thought this was inappropriate, and those with TDCS experience thought this was still appropriate, but less so. And finally, when it comes to building your own TDCS device, uh, both groups thought this was the least appropriate of all scenarios. Uh, those with, without TDCS experience thought this was, in general, definitely not okay, whereas those with TDCS experience uh, still thought it was, in general, acceptable, but of all the scenarios was the least so. So with that, I'm going to switch over to uh, hear our panelists, and we're going to first start with Dr. Alvaro, Alvaro Pasqualione. Thank you. Um, can I maybe try to connect the, the slides? Uh, I can try, right? Will I succeed? It should be okay. So, um, thank you, David. Thank you um, for the uh, panel and for the opportunity and the and the invitation. Um, I think it's a very timely uh, topic, uh, and uh, and I was excited. To, to see it sort of come to, to reality, particularly in this in this format of a of a panel with with arguably three different vantage points that, that hopefully will make the the subsequent discussion sort of interesting. Um, I think part of my um, role is to to make an argument from the point of view of quote science slash medical uh, applications. Um, and uh, in that context, uh, I think that uh, both uh, TMS and TCS, transcranial current simulation, be it in the form of direct current simulation, alternating current simulation, or random noise stimulation, uh, both of those sets of techniques uh, have both diagnostic and therapeutic applications. Um, the diagnostic applications are particularly obvious to date with the TMS uh, because of the type of more assumed focality that, uh, that David was, was pointing out. And, uh, and I think what is most appealing is the possibility of developing translatable biomarkers, translatable phenotypes of given disorders, be it in the form of cortical reactivity, connectivity, um, the type of uh, measures of cortical plasticity that, uh, that a number of groups, including ours, has, has developed. Um, and of course, the, the hope is to come up with, with metrics of characterization of brain physiology that comes closer to the manifestation of the, of the symptoms of the patients. I think that the, in the therapeutic realm, um, there is at least growing a promise for the techniques that revolve around transcranial current simulation because of their ease of application, because of their ease of combination with other approaches, and that makes it particularly appealing, even though to date um, what has really been substantiated with, with experimental data is really only TMS, and, and, the, and there is a need for, for the TCS to, to catch up. Um, so I, I, in terms of the, the diagnostic applications, I, I think of, of uh, the approach essentially as, as schematically illustrated in this little cartoon where um, the notion is there is some neural substrate uh, for behavior, whatever behavior it is, that involves activity in certain nodes 
of a distributed network. And even in the absence of knowing the exact neural substrate of those uh, components, if we had a way to do a control activation of different nodes, uh, we have a way to characterize that distributed uh, activation and a way of ultimately relate the changes in that activity to the behavior. If think about it as a sort of complex systems approach to characterizing brain behavior relations. And arguably, that is what non-invasive brain simulation allows us to do, do a control input into specific targeted nodes of a network, characterize the dynamics, capture the responses physiologically via EEG or MRI or near-infrared near spectroscopy or microstate modulations, any number of different measures or a combination thereof, and ultimately related to, to behavior. From a neurological point of view, I would argue that what that allows us to do is actually flip the traditional way of approaching translational science. So we generally expect science to develop some insights that we can then ultimately translate into a benefit for a patient. And we know that, for the most part, doesn't work. It certainly hasn't worked very well in neurology and, and psychiatry. Um, and we can discuss why that might be, but there is the opportunity of approach it in the opposite direction, starting with the patient, characterizing a phenotype that is closer to the disease manifestation, to the symptoms, and literally reverse engineer um, the research based on the clinic. If that requires clinicians being um, at the forefront of, of the effort and requires tool tools that, that uh, allow us to do just what I'm going to argue non-invasive brain simulation allows us to do, which is in a controlled way, as I've tried to, to um, discuss, modify, um, perturb the brain to measure the impact, while at the same time potentially helping patients. And that's what I think is the big appeal and promise of, of these techniques, with the promise of doing so in a very individualized way. But for the most part, it remains a promise at this point. And it remains a promise in part because that complete loop of getting the basic research informed by the clinical need it hasn't quite happened. And so we're still in need for a much greater um, level of understanding of what the neural substrate, what the mechanism of action of these techniques are. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, in a moment. But before doing that, let me just remind us that um, the field is moving very fast. And that, uh, in fact, is so fast that this slide is out of date already. Um, so uh, TMS devices, two of them, in fact now three of them, are approved for the treatment of medication refractory depression, the last one just being cleared on Friday. Um, and, uh, and they are quite different. They are covered by insurance, they are covered by um, Medicare, and they are making a difference in people's lives. Uh, um, you know, we can talk about it in a variety of different metrics, but perhaps the simplest one is to do a sort of back of the envelope calculation given the amount of devices that are in clinical use in the US today, about 600, given how many patients are treated, um, there's about 750,000 treatments per year, given the number of treatments that patients require for response and the response rate in terms of remission for medication refractory depression that uh, has been shown by a number of trials, including the FDA approval trials, Currently, TMS is leading to about 25 patients with an otherwise untreatable condition to go into remission, not into a response, but actually into a remission. Um, and that makes a difference in people's lives in, in, in ways that, that in neuropsychiatry, I think we've, we've hoped for for a long time. Um, there are a number of other applications in the horizon, but they are nowhere near uh, being as uh, established or, or supportive uh, by, by this. Um, that includes applications for TDCS. Uh, there are a number of uh, applications for, TDC, for TCS that have been supported by positive Cochrane reports in pain, neglect, and stroke recovery. Depression is supported by two fairly large, well-powered studies. 
cognitive restoration, including in dementia, um, there is support from ongoing studies. But what seems pretty clear is that we still really don't know the answer to the question of how effective this really is, uh, because having an effect in a small group of patients or in a number of small studies it may make it uh, possible to get a positive endorsement from the Cochrane report, but it doesn't establish uh, the capacity of extrapolating to the general population based on the, on the data that, that we have, and more importantly, from the general population back to the individual. And I think that is a really ongoing and outstanding question, and there are many, but one of them is, is, is who might really benefit, uh, you know, 30% going to remission, but who of the patients that you treat will do so with TMS? What are the reasons why some do and some do not? And the question is much larger with TCS where the data are, are less to draw from. But there are a number of other questions. What is the duration of the effect? What is the pattern of the maintenance that would be ideal uh, to maintain the benefit? I think particularly important, um, we've come to realize that there is great value in combining therapies brain simulation with other interventions, but how, when, and with what other therapies to combine are things that we still don't know. We don't know how to optimize a protocol or, for that matter, a brain target for a given patient. And there are outstanding questions of long-term uh, safety, not just efficacy. What is the cumulative dose over the lifespan that, that is appropriate to use? Um, and some of these questions we can only address over time, which makes it even more um, challenging. So I was saying, I think that the evidence that combining therapies is the way to go, I think is, is, uh, is growing. We can start thinking of brain simulation as priming some brain circuits, enabling the benefit from additional interventions, or vice versa, with uh, uh, either behavioral interventions or pharmacologic interventions or a combination thereof. Um, so, um, so that makes, as I was saying at the beginning, TCS particularly appealing because, as, as uh, David was mentioning, it is relatively simple, relatively straightforward to apply. I think that's both a benefit and a curse. It is deceivingly simple, um, meaning it makes you think that you actually know what the heck you're doing, um, when in fact you really don't. Uh, you're putting two electrodes somewhere, and we are talking then ultimately about this electrode having the effect on this part of the brain, when in fact we know that it's just not true. At the best case scenario, there is a current flow between two or more electrodes, and it's somewhere in the path of current that is generated that you have the effect. If, if you want to believe that the effect is coming from the brain, you know, I'm, I'm sort of brain-centric, but the truth is that the effects of, of brain simulation by by a definition, sorry about this, um, um, are always multimodal. Um, there's always an itching, there is always a sensation, there is always with TMS a tapping, there is always a clicking, there is always um, something plastered on you that is exerting some degree of, of uh, uh, tension, there's certainly always the expectation, be it positive or fear, of what the heck is going to happen to you. And all those things are going to have an impact on the effect, in addition to whatever effect the stimulation has on CSF and the diffuse effect on the brain, plus the local effect on the brain. And which one is it that is more critical? I don't think that we know. I think we believe, and there is data to support, that there is a possibility of an effect on specific brain structures, but most of the studies don't actually establish that link in terms of showing that the clinical or behavioral effect is really true to the engagement of a given substrate. I think we need more understanding of the substrates. We need designs of uh, trials that, that capture the, the engaged uh, substrate in addition to asking the question of, um, of what the behavioral effect is. We have the tools to do that, but the, the, the research has to, has to catch up. Now, um, before wrapping up, I want to, to, to um, address one of the things that, that David um, mentioned. Uh, 
sort of in passing, there is this transcranial direct current simulation, and, the, uh, and there are really a, a whole family of techniques that are involved in, in that. Uh, you can apply direct current, you can apply alternating current in different frequencies, this TACS. You can apply random noise with a mix of, of frequencies. And I think that the evidence is pretty good that all these have different mechanisms of action. In doing that, they have potentially different applications and different opportunities offered, but also different challenges. And so to think of it as one technique, to think of TDCS or TMS or TACS is or is not good for Alzheimer's disease or for depression, I think is fundamentally the wrong way to think about this. Uh, these are tools, these are techniques to modulate specific networks, perhaps in addition to other non-brain derived, uh, not brain uh, focus uh, substrates. And I think it is that level of, of broader uh, effect that we need, we need to consider. We need to do so, however, accepting the fact that these techniques particularly, for the reasons that David was, was saying, are already in the hands of a lot of people that, that, they, that believe that they have a need that we in the medical community, I think, have failed to, to provide, right? And, and, the, and we need to now deal with the fact that, that we want the use of these techniques to be done in a way that is both safe and, and appropriate. And I think that's, that's the welcome opportunity of this, this um, uh, colloquium and, 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 uh, and discussion, I, I think. And, and it was a part of the focus of a recent IOM uh, meeting. I think that the, the fact is that people are getting devices and applying it to loved ones or seeking opportunities to develop clinics around these, these tools and applying it off-label. And there are both challenges from a regulatory point of view, but, but from a clinical science perspective, there is the need to engage in those, those communities, in those users be it over the counter with the industry developed or be it do it yourself uh, communities in such a way that at the very least we continue to learn from uh, that application and prevent potential damage because uh, some of the things being done are frankly not safe. And, and so I think there is a, a reality to contend with including the fact that from the medical establishment these techniques offer hope and we need to develop the studies to, us to provide that support while facing the need of helping patients today. Um, so just my final comment is that I think we're faced a little bit with the same situation as in education. I've made that, that uh, argument be before, but the, in the absence of detailed knowledge of how to do best mathematic training uh, in high school, it, it'll be the wrong thing for us to, to respond to parents with the expectation that they take their kids home and bring them back three generations from now when we have the time to develop appropriate ways to, to teach mathematics. Um, that is not the way that education works. And it's not because we know everything about how to best educate. It's because there are needs and realities of, of individuals. I think the same is true highlighted by the development of these techniques. Pharmacological applications and other interventions don't work well enough. Uh, patients with neuropsychiatric disorders face significant disability. There is the hope that these techniques can help. And it is on us to develop the research and the support and the understanding to optimize those interventions. But it'd be absurd not to face the need of these patients and, and, and help them to, to use the techniques appropriately. And I'll stop there and pass it to you, Hank. Steal away. Oh, I know how it works. I've been to this rodeo before. I have no slides to worry about. Uh, I just think this is one of the greatest areas around to be interested in. Uh, I want to talk about it. It's the area in neuroethics and neuroscience that I find most interesting right now. 
for a couple of reasons. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the context, both general and specific, for today's, that I see today's issue being in. And then I want to talk about the three ethical issues I see with respect to cognitive enhancement through neurostimulation. Those issues are safety, fairness, and coercion. But to start with some context, what I find so exciting about this on the one hand is the issues around non-invasive neuromodulation. I prefer modulation to stimulation because sometimes you may be repressing neurons rather than stimulating them, but you're changing them, you're modulating them. And as Alvaro pointed out, uh, there was an Institute of Medicine workshop on March 1st and 2nd that we were two of the organizers of that looked at a variety of modalities and a variety of uses, from medical uses to non-medical uses, mood, cognitive enhancement, a variety of things. And it is, I think, one of the most interesting frontiers right now for neuroscience and for psychiatric disease. Part of that is a message of desperation. <laughs> things haven't worked very well for us with respect to psychiatric diseases for the last couple of decades. We've had some successes, but not nearly as many as we hoped. The drugs have not turned out to be the panaceas that they were at one point hoped to be. Non-invasive -in neuromodulation, things like deep brain stimulation, work for some things pretty well and have some indications of working for others. But doing the neurosurgery to stick electrodes deep into a brain, that gets a little pricey and has its own set of problems. If you can do something like that non-invasively, it opens up lots of potential. And there is at least enough evidence that some of this works for some things to make it really intriguing. It also remains a little bit mysterious because nobody, as far as I can tell, frankly, has any good idea about how any of it works. There's a lot of hand-waving speculation, some of which I suspect will turn out to be true, uh, although not necessarily. Uh, but something's going on with this, and it's a bunch of different thises, too. Alvaro talked about transcranial magnetic stimulation as well as transcranial electric stimulation. And the electric can be direct, it can be alternating, it can be all sorts of different current things, from 9-volt batteries to electroconvulsive therapy, which has miraculous results on some patients with depression. We also have focused ultrasound, a completely new modality with a different sort of approach that's also um, showing some signs of doing things to people's brains. So the science on non-invasive neuromodulation is expanding quickly. It has the potential, which may not be realized, to do great things in a context where we've had a shortage of great things. And so looking for something new makes a lot of sense. That's one context. Second broad context is human enhancement. We've had lots of discussions, and they're continuing discussions, about human biological enhancement, whether it is from giving people inborn, you know, ingrown night vision to changing the germline of the human genome to make it, giving people powered suits that make them iron men to giving college students Adderall so they do better on exams, or at least they think they do better on exams. It's a whole, uh, to performance enhancing drugs and sports, which may be the area that's gotten the most attention. All of these are subsets of the broader question of human biological enhancement which raises a lot of concerns for people. Today's topic is the intersection of those two. We're not going to talk about performance enhancing in sports, although TDCS might help some sports. Uh, but we are going to talk about biological enhancement on the one hand, non-invasive neuromodulation on the other. That's general context. So both of those fields are fascinating, the scientifically and medically fascinating, the non-invasive neuromodulation. Uh, ethically, legally, practically fascinating, the questions of human biological enhancement. You take fascinating and you multiply it by fascinating, and I think you get fascinating squared, although I haven't had math in a long time. You get something that's pretty cool to look into. Concrete context. If we're talking about transcranial direct current or transcranial electrical stimulation for purposes of enhancement, giving good ethical analysis requires some good facts. Thought experiments are very useful. They've got their place. But if you want to give practical advice, you got to know what's going on in the actual world and what, or at least what's likely to go on, what's likely to be happening. And I think the context pieces that are most important 
with respect to these issues are questions like, how effective is it? Is it effective at all? Is it effective for everybody? Is it effective only for some people? Is it effective for certain behaviors and not other behaviors? If it is no more effective than a good cup of coffee, that's an interesting thing to know. If it turns you into um, the guy who wins Jeopardy, uh, I guess it's a computer now, but Ken Jennings or whatever his name was, you know, that's also interesting to know. How effective it is makes a difference in the ethical analysis. So does how safe is it? So does how expensive is it? Most of those things we don't know the answer to yet, but they're important considerations to keep in, keep in mind because that context affects the ethical analysis, to which I shall now turn. I think there are three big ethical issues with this, all of which I think are the three big ethical issues with respect to human biological enhancement in general. I do not think one of them is, should we enhance ourselves? Because as far as I can tell, since we came out of the trees or left the savanna, those of us who did leave the savanna, Northern California is looking more and more savanna to desert-like with every passing drought month, all we have done as humans is try to enhance ourselves. We've enhanced ourselves physically, and we've enhanced ourselves cognitively. I would argue that the single greatest cognitive enhancement ever in humanity is, read is reading and writing, allowing you to pass information on much farther in space and in time than we could before. And that changed things. And there, I'm sure, are people who are unhappy about it. Imagine the poor Greek bards who had spent years memorizing the Iliad and the Odyssey, and some young schmuck comes along and starts reading it off a scroll. Unfair competition. <laughs> Clearly, they would have been upset. Enhancement is what we do. So I think the idea that enhancement overall is wrong is silly. That doesn't mean that some sorts of enhancement might not be wrong. But on what grounds? And I think there are three big issues to think about. Safety is the first. Safety is really important. Not necessarily the absolute amount of safety, whatever that means, but how well we understand the safety and the relative safety to the gains. And that's why safety, I think, is more important for enhancement than it is for medical treatment. If you wanted a drug, if you had metastatic pancreatic cancer, which I hope none of you has, you have a life expectancy of less than a year and a really painful and unpleasant year at that. If I could offer you a drug that would cure half of the people with this instantly and kill the other half instantly and painlessly, that's an incredibly safe and effective drug in that context. If we were to do the same thing for something that would make you better at math, not so good. With medical things, the risk that you're trying to overcome, the deficit you're trying to overcome, it tends to be more significant. Not always, teenage acne, for example, not always, but tends to be more significant than the plus you're looking for, the benefit that you could get from enhancement. So safety is particularly important in the enhancement context. And safety, frankly, I worry about a lot here. I worry about efficacy a lot. You have to balance safety and efficacy. And I think right now the answer with efficacy and all of these forms of cognitive enhancement is unproven, unclear, interesting, but not yet sure. The safety issues also need further investigation, I think, more than the FDA seems to thus far have been concerned about. Not so worried about short-term efficacy, except maybe for the guys who go to Radio Shack and set up the thing wrong when they follow the schematics off the internet, which happens. But the longer-term efficacy, we really don't know very much about. The longer-term safety, we really don't know very much about. What happens if somebody uses this every day for a year? Maybe it has bad effects. Maybe it has good effects. Maybe it has no effects. I'd be interested in learning that before we push this on in a big way. So I think the safety issues are really important. They can become even more important in some of the other contexts. One of the other contexts is fairness. If this turns out to be no more than a cup of coffee, I'm not very worried about fairness. I'm not too worried about somebody getting an unfair advantage because she can use TDCS before going into her exam if her classmate can get the same effect with a good cup of coffee. If it turns out to be really effective, then fairness becomes more of an issue. I would note it's not unique to this. 
Our society, and I think every society, but maybe particularly our society, is unfair in lots of ways that affect cognition. If you can get SAT tutoring, you're likely to get a better score on the SAT than somebody who can't. If you chose your parents wisely and chose well-educated, stable couple, your odds, not that it's impossible, but your odds of getting into a very good school and doing very well academically are better than if you were born to a single poor young mother who had no education and didn't value it very much. These are unfairnesses that already exist, but you wouldn't necessarily want to add to them. So depending on how effective it is, the question of fairness is, can be important. It doesn't mean that that's a slam dunk, yes, no, stop, start issue, though. There are ways we could, if it's unfair, try to deal with it other than banning it. For example, you could make it available to everybody. I could imagine, let's say this works great on organic chemistry. And so all of America's pre-meds, who for reasons that have nothing to do with their future practice of medicine, <laughs> my wife just retired after 30 years of medicine, during which she never had to remember the Krebs cycle, despite having memorized it five times in order to get through, get into and get through med school. Let's say that it really helps pre-meds do well in organic chemistry. And it might be unfair to make the line is who gets into med school and who doesn't depend on who had good drugs. <coughs> One solution might be make the drugs available to everybody. Another solution might be have separate curves. Have one curve for the drug group and one curve for the non-drug group. Or you could have drug tests, make everybody pee into a cup before they take organic chemistry. And then you can have a question on the exam about how exactly that urine is going to be analyzed biochemically. Um, there are, there are ways we can try to mitigate the fairness issues. They're not perfect ways, but they're ways we should think of. It's not just we should ban it entirely to prevent unfairness, or we should allow it entirely and just live with the unfairness. There are intermediate positions. Last issue, coercion. Coercion worries me a lot. If somebody doesn't want to do this, should they be able to be forced to use it? The military currently quasi-coerces pilots into using amphetamines or provigil or other things to stay awake. They have an argument for this that I think has a certain plausibility. If you've got somebody who's flying for 12 hours, you'd kind of like them to be awake, unless you can actually have enough crew that they can take turns sleeping, etc. cetera. Uh, it, they say it's not exactly uh, ordered. You've given a choice. But your choice is either take the drugs and fly, or you don't fly. And if you're a flyer, the answer is always you do what you need to do in order to fly. That's what they live for. That's what they do. That's coercive. Stanford could order me, I hope they won't, to take remedial teaching classes. You know, Greeley, your, your uh, ratings have been slipping. We think you need a little bit of help. You know, we need you to take this. And even though I've got tenure, if I didn't do it, unpleasantness could ensue. They certainly require me to listen to various seminars on all sorts of exciting topics. Uh, exciting there being an ironic, you know, did I get the ironic expression? Yeah. Could employers require you to do this? Could the government require you to do this? Could parents require their kids to do this? And I think in some respects that's the hardest. I'm a parent, 27 and 23, so 26 and 23, both past teenage years uh, alive, um, so successfully. When you're a parent, your job is to coerce your kids into being enhanced, you know, to try to coerce them to be better people, to teach them how to be social and how to be nice and, how, and to care about learning and all those things. That's your duty. On the other hand, do we want parents doing TDCS or other things on their kids when the kids don't, the kids can't say, yes, I want to do this, even if they say it at age four? We don't believe them. We can't believe them. And so I think this intersection between parental authority and children's autonomy with respect to enhancement, particularly if there are some significant safety, efficacy, or fairness issues, may be one of the hottest topics of all. So I think those are the main issues. There are a bunch of interesting FDA and other regulatory issues. I commend to your attention the Journal of Law and Biosciences at Oxford University Press online journal that's now published, I think, in its four issues, six or seven different things about 
enhancement through transcranial direct current or other methods, and has another big one coming out that's actually a survey of people who've used it and how they've used it and what they found out and what they thought about it. It's a fascinating issue, and I think I will shut up and let uh, Tim tell us something about uh, what may be coming, what will be coming down the pike very soon. Thank you. That's Tim. Jamie. I know it's Tim Tyler, but that's not you. Yeah, Tim Tyler is definitely not me. You know, there's no surprise. I think this will work fine. Maybe we need to just get one more killer. Okay, um, thanks for uh, organizing the event and uh, inviting me here today. Um, I'm going to say hi to our office that's out in Silicon Valley. They all notified me that they're watching um, for me to smile, so hi. Um, so I am a co-founder and uh, CSO of Think. Um, we are um, on the verge of launching uh, the first product that we feel is a very serious product in this category. Um, that enables people to shift their mental states on demand, literally um, via a switch. Um, first, in keeping true to our um, academic uh, background within uh, HMS, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I am the co-founder and CSO board member of Think. Uh, I'm an inventor on pending and issued patents um, related to non-invasive brain stimulation systems, methods, and devices. Um, so the first question, I think this has been brought up uh, a couple times already today, is uh, how do you influence your brain, right? So we all influence our brain. Um, and it was, I think, kind of poetically stated that since we left the Savannah, we've been trying to enhance ourselves um, ever since then, and we'll continue to do that throughout time. Um, people use caffeine, alcohol, pharmaceuticals, off-label prescription. Um, you, could, you could probably argue there's, I don't, we could do the same survey and ask how many people have taken Adderall before the medical exams. I'm not sure we get honest answers, but uh, the numbers might surprise you. They'd probably be quite high, um, or studying for medical exams. So uh, about four years ago, Izzy Goldwasser, who's the CEO of our company, um, and I got together and we, we um, decided to, to start a company. And, and the fabric of our company, the DNA of our company is really, uh, we're scientists. Um, we, we pride ourselves in science. Um, we had a couple mantras that we followed by um, that we would develop a safe product and it would be a, a product that people could experience and feel and it would have a, a big impact on their lives and it would be a consumer product and not a therapeutic. Um, the reason we did this is we looked at, if you look at the history of non-invasive brain stimulation dating back to the 60s, depending on whose accounts you read, this dates back to the, the you know, late 19th century. Um, but you can see there's um, an exponential gain, uh, exponential increase in the number of, of uh, these are peer-reviewed studies um, per year, right? And so you can look in 2014, there were over 1,400 papers published that year on non-invasive uh, neuromodulation methods, right? Um, TMS was introduced by Anthony Barker in 1982. TDCS um, was kind of reintroduced in 2000. Um, and if you look at that in parallel, driven by the parallel advancements in the wearables field, the wearables market, fitness trackers, other wearables that people have, you know, most of these tend to fit in the fitness tracker category. You can see that there's a convergence where the two will meet, right? And that's really what Think represents. We really are a company that's trying to bring modern neuroscience to the consumer world by practicing solid science, sound engineering to deliver safe products that will allow people to do what they've been doing since the beginning of time. Um, so that was our idea. Um, the way we, we look at our company is um, we're not a company that works on any type of cognitive enhancer, right? We don't, we don't work on cognitive enhancement. Um, we really are a company where our technology mission is to impact brain health. And what I mean by that is there's certain things that, you, that, that you know, we think about, we engage in every day, that impact brain health. And these, some of these are obvious, some are not so obvious. One is reducing stress, improving the quality of sleep, increasing energy, promoting smart choices, 
boosting motivation, enhancing focus, and encouraging socialization. Even if you have all these things, many people tend to forget this one, right? Even if you have all these things, you get great rest, you have low stress, you have good energy when you need, you make smart choices, but if you don't have friends and family to support you, you're really not a balanced individual, and I would, I would argue that you probably don't have a healthy brain, right? Um, so this is where we focus our energy, we focus our efforts. Our first product really will focus on this area, reducing stress and increasing energy. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, I just wanna show you some of the, the science behind, uh, the type of science that we do. Um, we have two offices, one is in Los Gatos, California, and the other is in Boston in the Prudential Tower. We conduct studies, IRB approved studies on human subjects all day long. Um, studies, the types of studies we do are wide ranging, um, but so I'll tell you a little bit about that. The way that we see um, these two initial modes, this is what we call them, we have calm vibes and we have energy vibes, right? So there's an energy mode and a calm mode. I'll talk about the science behind it and exactly what, what happens with each one of these in a minute, but the way we see these doing is really what you're doing is you're optimizing your psychophysiological arousal for a given task, right? So when you want to be more calm, we can help you become more calm. When you want to have more energy or a boost in motivation, we can help you do that as well. And if you think about this, this goes back to, this is kind of a classic curve where on the x-axis we have levels of arousal and on the y-axis we have physical and mental performance. We have energy vibes that we will introduce to the consumer market soon and calm vibes will also be introduced. But if you think about your performance, there's certain tasks that are low arousal optimized tasks where you have to be very calm to perform well. Surgery might be an example, right? You probably don't want your surgeon jacked up on methamphetamine or a lot of caffeine. Well, I mean, robotic surgery now is a little bit different, but there's certain tasks where you want to be calm to perform well, and there's certain tasks where you need a little bit of more, a little more arousal to perform well, right? So if you're too calm, you're not going to be able to perform those tasks well. And so we think about the ability to switch between those two on demand will really empower people to, to you know, to be able to utilize their psychophysiological um, arousal to achieve a certain end. The major principles and mechanisms by which we see this working. So this is the point where I'd like to say, look, we do not, what we do is not transcranial direct current stimulation. Transcranial direct current stimulation is a 1960s technology. It uses typically sponge electrodes saturated in saline. Um, when you see subjects that undergo this, they have saline water dripping off their face. It's, you know, a, a bandage wrapped around their head to hold the electrodes in place. Um, so over the past four years, we've invested the equivalent of about 17 to 20 R01s in advancing the platform um, several decades beyond that. Um, we believe the way that transcranial direct current stimulation and transcranial alternating current stimulation work, and um, Dr. Pasquale alluded to this, um, is that it's, it's multimodal. We believe that we're activating cranial nerves and cervical nerves, cervical spinal nerves, right? So one of the electrodes, um, goes over the temple and activates um, the maxillary and ophthalmic um, branch of the trigeminal nerve. And another electrode for the calm effect goes in the back of the neck and activates C2 and C3 sp uh, cervical spinal afferents. For the energy vibe, um, uh, the electrode in the front stays in the same place and the electrode in the rear goes on the mastoid and activates the greater auricular branch of C2, C3 uh, spinal nerves. I think this has been overlooked in the field for quite some time. People just assume that there's current passing across the skin and the skull and the CSF. When we talk to people who actually put electrodes on the dura, the currents that they have to use to generate a response in the brain are about 10 times higher than what, you, what is applied for TDCS. And that's directly on top of the dura. That's not counting the skull or the skin. Um, if you look at the pathways and you look at what's been described in the literature, it seems to be fairly consistent. Most people describe it, you know, you can get this modulation of psychophysiological arousal. That's fairly consistent. The cognitive effects have not been so consistent. If you look at the pathways, and this is textbook anatomy, the trigeminal nerve and, and the cervical spinal afferents feed directly into the trigeminal nucleus in the pons of the brainstem. The nucleus of the solitary tract, so C2, C3, facial nerve, all feed into the, the nucleus of the solitary tract and the trigeminal nucleus. Those have direct monosynaptic connections with the locus cerullus and the reticular formation. So those of you who have had neuroanatomy know that the reticular formation is, is essentially a seat of consciousness. 
This is the first place where all sensory information is integrated in the brain for the first time, right? Below the pons, not conscious. Above the pons, that's where consciousness begins. And so we believe that mod by modulating the reticular formation, reticular activating system in the locus cerullus and neuroadrenergic system, that you can start to modulate psychophysiological arousal without modulating cortical function. And when you look at these types of mechanisms, you start to see, you start to find that you can gain robust effects across populations such that you get these effects in 85 to 90 percent of the population. If we were modulating cortex and we were trying to understand the way the electric field was affecting brain and considering gyral anatomy and different, different folds in different patients, this becomes more of a problem. And I think that's why people are looking at TDCS and taking that approach and they're not really understanding what's happening and, and so the results haven't been as consistent. So we spent a lot of time trying to understand the mechanisms of action uh, by the way that our, our device works and we haven't even launched it yet. Safety is probably the, the foremost thing that we've concerned ourselves with since day one. We work um, also on using ultrasound for neuromodulation, um, particularly for you know, trying to ask, assess, um, access deep brain targets. But we realized very early on in the company that it was gonna be harder to prove out the safety using focused ultrasound for neuromodulation um, compared to using electrical stimulation. And so we've, um, the, our safety margins we're about 100 times below any levels that would damage neuronal tissue, right? So we have a, a pretty large safety margin. Our device has been um, looked at by independent medical device groups uh, that, that evaluate medical devices. Our output levels are actually below, our peak output level is uh, about 20 milliamps, and that's below devices that you can go buy off the shelf that um, are such as TENS devices, right? There's a class of TENS devices um, that are they're cleared through a 510K process. They're tens for aesthetic purposes. And these devices actually you wear on the face and they stimulate the trigeminal nerve. Those devices can generate a current density of about 46 milliamps per centimeter squared, which is incredibly high. In the TDCS world and TACS world, the best practice is to keep the current density below two milliamps per centimeter squared. So there's devices that are out there that already generate 20 times the current density They've already been approved by the FDA. They've been used, these devices have been used for 40 years with no uh, serious adverse events. If you look at where we are, um, we fall in what we've defined as limited output um, designation. And this comes from some language that was developed by the FDA several years ago um, in which they said that like below this, some of these devices may be considered to be exempt from pre-market notification or 510K process. Um, and, and really here it's below a, a current, an average current that's 10 milliamps, um, and then a current density below two milliamps per centimeter squared. And so if you look at all these other devices that fall you know, outside, these are all devices that have been cleared by the FDA for over-the-counter use, right? Some of these are, there's a couple in here that are for, um, that are prescription use, but you can go buy these devices at Walgreens or CVS or any, anywhere else. We just completed, um, hopefully by the end of the week, we'll post it, we'll probably post it on BioArchive, which is a, a preprint repository um, that's housed at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. We ran to what's to date the longest um, TD, comparison of TDCS and um, what we call transdermal uh, electrical neurosignaling, our transcranial pulse current stimulation. We did this in collaboration with Marone Bixen at the City College of New York. Um, so we, we ran 100 participants um, in three different treatment groups. One treatment group was a sham. One was um, uh, conventional TDCS. And one was using our technology. They were randomly assigned to each one of these groups and blinded. They came in and nat we set up a naturalistic environment. It was kind of like a library or coffee shop. They came in four to five days a week. They used the device for 20 minutes a day. And we had pretty, pretty conservative exclusion criteria um, throughout the trial. We, did, we conducted over 1,800 stimulation sessions, 20-minute um, sessions. Basically, what we saw was that the, our technology outperformed, in terms of tolerability, outperformed conventional TDCS. And that's because we worked really hard on the electrodes. We don't use sponge electrodes. Our electrodes are hydrogel electrodes that actually are optimized for, for comfort. It's completely comfortable. There's no irritation of the skin. After someone gets through running a vibe, you can look at the skin and it's, it's not even red, right? There's not even redness of the skin. 
Um, the incidence of um, uh, side effects. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the incidence of side effects, the most common side effects were um, uh, uh, minor skin irritation and uh, tingling of the skin and a uh, mild headache. Um, it, it turns out that the, we couldn't distinguish between groups because the, uh, the, the incidence rates were so low, so they were equivalent to sham. So for example, the sham condition had an incidence rate of headache for about 3.5%, and the transcranial pulse current stimulation had an incidence rate of headache of about 2.7%. Um, so, you know, there are people in the population that if you just put a sponge on their head and do nothing else to them, they will develop a headache, right? And that's just kind of a placebo effect. Um, experimental validation, we, um, you know, we, we run lots of different studies. Um, one series of studies that we ran was uh, basically a quantitative effort where you use quantitative biometrics such as heart rate, uh, heart rate variability, um, galvanic skin response, and we also assayed uh, biomarkers of stress from the saliva. Um, so those of you who know about autonomic fun function, which I presume most people in this room do, um, you understand that heart rate, heart rate variability are somewhat controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So we, the way this, this particular study worked, and we published this, is available on BioArchive now. Um, it's, it's undergoing peer review, um, but the, the way we work, we like to be very transparent with our science. So we like to put the preprint out and allow people to see what we're doing as it takes the next 18 months to undergo peer review, right? Which that has its own problems we could talk about in another uh, forum. Um, what we found is that when people, the combi, they, they come in and we, we expose them to a fear conditioning trial, classical conditioning trial, where they see a series of nature scenes. And when they see a bolt of lightning, they've been pre-instructed that they will be shocked. And we deliver a mild electrical shock to their finger. It doesn't hurt, but it is uncomfortable. And then after that, they undergo a series of time-constrained cognitive tasks, a stroop task, a flanker task, and an um, a, uh, in-back task. And so what we found is that people who had the calm vibe compared to the sham had a significant reduction in heart rate variability, and uh, particularly in the low-frequency spectrum. They had significantly reduced levels of salivary alpha amylase, which is a biomarker. It's a surrogate marker of the sympatheto, uh, sympathetic adrenal medullary axis, as opposed to cortisol, which is really a marker of the HP axis. Um, people had a significantly suppressed response, GSR responses. So th th during the baseline, they're watching a series of videos. When the videos stop and switch to still images, there's an immediate increase in the GSR. So this is the sympathetic skin response. Um, this is kind of a classic response, but this is an anticipatory response because they know that they're about to begin the shocks are about to come, right? And then for every single shock they get, there's also a little um, transient increase in GSR. Both of those were significantly suppressed in the um, condition where subjects received calm vibes compared to sham. We uh, then looked at cognitive performance. So on the flanker, um, the stroop and the in back, and there were no significant differences between the treatment groups, indicating that we're not affecting cognition per se, but we are indeed affecting psychophysiological arousal. And those two things are somewhat disentangleable. When we asked subjects, how the, we, we found that one of the best biomarkers, you know, with all the fitness trackers and sensors that are in the world, the best thing you can do is just ask someone, right? You just ask them, how do you feel? Right, and there is this there is this expectancy, right? So people, if you if I bring someone in off the street and say, hey, this, this subject's going to come in and they're going to do a, a you know, they're going to be involved in a, a neuromodulation experiment, there's some anxiousness, acute state anxiety that's that's associated with that event. And as the person sits down, we put electrodes on their head. And after 20 minutes, they don't experience anything negative. You can imagine they start to calm down. So there's a very strong sham effect or placebo effect associated with these types of experiments. We spent about a year and a half trying to beat the sham effect through an iterative process. We just kept refining our waveforms, refining our waveforms, and getting a little bit better, and a little bit better, and a little bit better, until we got to the point where we were absolutely convinced that we could beat the placebo effect. When you look at these, these distributions, as a rating scale, it's a, it's a scale of zero to 10. Um, we, we tell people that a five on this scale for the calmness scale is like a, a single drink of alcohol. Um, and the rating scale for uh, energy uh, uh, five is a single cup of coffee. 
You can see the distributions, but there's a significant increase in the, the calmness, the sensation of relaxation, or the perceived or subjective reported sensation of energy that's reported by individuals after they receive either the calm or the energy vibe. So lastly, imp impact and, and discussion points uh, for the rest of the afternoon. Um, you know, there's lots of imp potential impact with how our technology will impact um, the world. I think that one thing we, we're going to do is we are, we, although we as a company are not going to engage in the commercialization of any therapeutic device, we want to work with clinical partners and clinical re clinicians who are gonna investigate how this may be used to treat anxiety, for example. So while we say we're gonna reduce stress, a clinician may say this person has anxiety and we're gonna study how this may affect anxiety or even PTSD or insomnia versus just not being able to sleep. I think one of the biggest opportunities that's yet to be realized is how this is gonna affect the, affect the uh, entire effort on brain mapping, right? So every, everyone in the world is crazy and fixated right now on brain mapping. And I actually think we're probably taking the wrong approach um, because as Dr. Pasqualone talked about, when you bring a subject into the lab and you try to understand what's happening to their brain, it's a completely artificial environment. And whatever, you, whatever little piece of information you can extrapolate from those experiments is not really meaningful in a real world context. And I'd like to illustrate that by just showing this video. So this is what happens in the real world, right? This is not a laboratory setting. And if you think about how you go about your day you're moving in and out of your labs, you're moving in and out of classes, you're being affected by the sounds in these environments, the smells in these environments, the people that are around you, the people that you see, the people you sit next to on the train, the people you bump into on the sidewalk. Every single one of these things affects the brain and they affect the brain in completely different ways. And the only way that we're gonna be able to understand this is to deploy a platform that's able to modulate neural circuits and record from neural circuits in the real world. And right now that, ca that capacity is not, it's non-existent, but it will be very soon. And so I really think that there's a major opportunity, you know, if we, if we talk about what the brain mapping, what brain mapping really is all about, this is what we want to understand. We want to understand the relationship between brain and behavior, whether that's pathological processes or normal processes, this is what we want to understand. We want to understand how the environment, the body, sensation, perception, and cognition all give rise to certain behaviors. This is a huge opportunity, right? We're, we're, we're approaching a world where the, the, everything is connected to the internet, right? The internet of things. So we should also connect the brain to the internet of things, both from an input and output standpoint. By the year 2020, the world's population will be 7.6 billion, but there will be 50 billion devices connected to the internet. There's a huge opportunity to collect data and to try to understand behavior and behavioral patterns, especially if you're modulating known neural circuits in the real world. So where we are is we, we have a platform where we can modulate brain activity, known neural circuits in individuals. It's a wearable neuromodulation. We can modulate that in social structures it's literally scalable to billions, right? I mean, there's 7.6 billion people in the world. If you factor out everyone who's over the age of 18, there's still a couple billion people that we have an opportunity to modulate their brain. We can use this in real world use cases to study decision making, daily performance, communication, physiological arousal, attention, relaxation, memory. We can collect real world data, neurocognitive metrics, biometric sensors, heart rate, heart rate variability, how many times you text your wife, how many times you text your husband, how many times you yell at your child, um, how many times you, um, you know, give positive reinforcement to one of your employees. Um, biopsychological feedback, geospatial information, where you go, who you talk to. Um, and then use machine learning to develop statistical brain maps and really understand how modulating those known brain networks are affecting behavior. This is what I think there's a huge opportunity here that's being completely overlooked. We're not going to find how the brain works in a voxel from an fMRI. Um, and so final discussion points, um, responsible company efforts can accelerate research and engineering in terms of manufacturing and validating medical grade products that are safe for consumers. This is a costly process. This is not something that you do in your garage. This is not something you have a couple buddies come over and get some duct tape and solder and hack together. It's not for Reddit, right? Um, it requires multidisciplinary teams with deep experience to do this safely. 
Companies are, are better poised to tackle regulatory hurdles that face consumer and thera therapeutic neuromodulation devices. Single academic groups, not even Harvard Medical School, can go to the FDA and get a device approved because the amount of money, the amount of effort that has to, they have, you have to have a responsible entity that goes to the FDA and interacts with the FDA or goes to the underwriter's laboratory or IEC or who, whatever regulatory agency there is that is gonna take ownership of that product and make sure it's ushered through to the market. Lead uh, VC-backed companies can set the example for others by delivering medical-grade products that are compliant with federal and international safety guidelines versus skirting loopholes and regulatory frameworks. There's been a lot of debate about what a medical device is, right? It, a Band-Aid is a medical device. A crutch is a medical device. A Band-Aid is a class one medical device and a condom is a class two medical device. Electrical stimulation is a class two medical device. Whether it's regulated as a medical device by these regulatory bodies or not depends on the intended use and indication of that device. And that is the law. Successful consumer products will draw expansive research funding into this area, more so than other academic e efforts because of the total addressable population is large. If you combine all the people in the world who have depression, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease together, it's still a fraction of the number of people you can affect and impact if you develop a consumer device, right? And improving consumer brain health from a lifestyle and wellness approach can uh, reduce major burdens on our healthcare system as well as support future clinical efforts. And that's all. So are there any questions? We might as well just jump right in, right? Yeah. Can I? Is that on? So, so um, if I can just just um, push on on one particular thing, because uh, um, so you basically presented, I think, a, a, an elegant hypothesis of a mechanism of action, but but it's just that, just to be clear, right? Uh, so the fact that you say this is because of the reticular formation, um, first of all. The hypothesis should be testable. Um, one could image it. Uh, I mean, if you believe my chairman, then the answer really is that's a nonsensical hypothesis because you will never find the reticular formation because it's there in the netters of this world, but it's no longer really there and nobody really believes its existence. Um, so so it's, it's a very good sounding hypothesis but it really is not a scientific hypothesis because it cannot be tested, uh, because in fact, we've moved beyond the reticular formation to a different conceptualization of, of brainstream structures. Right? And, and, and so, I, I, it, I mean, I just want to push it because I, I think you're doing the right thing by, by framing um, a concept of, of a device in the setting of a, of, of a scientific um, approach and a responsible approach but it's, it's still a sort of slippery argument to give people, right? Because most people listening to it would take it as a fact, and it sounds really good to say you want to activate the V2 branch, the maxillary nerve, because that's something phenomenally unique going to a specific, what was it again, tractus solitarius? What the heck is that? I mean, it, it sounds really good, but but... First of all, it's not testable exactly, and, and second, maybe it doesn't matter from the point of view of the outcome, and, and so why go there? I think we, so I think first we have to go there, right? We have to understand how it works to make it better. The, the world of TDCS and TMS has failed miserably in this aspect. I think if you, if you touch, like we don't have, you said it yourself, we don't have a good understanding of how any of these methods work and they're multimodal. If you touch this location on your head, how does it get to your brain? Trace the pathway. How does it get to your head? But, but, but what is the main pathway if you touch this part of your head, if you feel that sensation, how does it get to your somatosensory cortex? Who, can try, who, who wants to trace it on the board? It's certainly the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve to the trigeminal sensory nucleus. Yes. What is it? What is it? What is it? It's not the maxillary branch. Yes, this is a superorbital branch. This is the, the maxillary branch runs right up through here and branches off here. You can look at the anatomy. So when people, so when people feel the sensation of transcranial direct current stimulation, 
when they feel that sensation, if it's on their scalp, it, I don't know, like it doesn't go straight to the somatosensory cortex. That's for sure. Is it carried by some mystical fiber we haven't discovered yet? I don't think so. I think it's probably carried by cranial nerves via the pons of the brainstem through the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex. In root, and it's been known for 50 years, that sensory stimulation activates neurons in the locus cerullus. So I don't think the reticular formation itself is the main responsible nucleus. I think it's part of it. It's a diffuse network that's responsible for arousal. That's why when I snap my fingers, it alerts people's attention. Sorry, those are testable hypotheses. What I'm saying simply is that, that when you say it's really critical that we get at the signs, um, I obviously agree with that. Uh, but, but, the, but to be clear, it's not critical from the point of view of testing efficacy for any one outcome. There is a lot of medications that we use, and we use well. I think it was Hank that mentioned electroconvulsive therapy. We have no freaking idea how it works, none. We, we, you know, we can discuss it, but that it works, there is little doubt. It's the best antidepressant out there, by far none. Um, and, and so um, I think those are two different questions. Uh, what is the, the substrate of function, and what is the, um, the efficacy, as it were? My, my, my commentary was simply because by framing it the way you do, which is very smart from a business point of view and a very interesting hypothesis, to, to, to be clear, I don't think that you're framing just a hypothesis. You're presenting it as this is what we know to be relevant, which, which appeals to the population, I think, in a bit of a leaning way, right? And that, that, that's all. So this could go on forever, but I think like I, I think I think we have to like it's hard to imagine a scenario where you can place an electrode on the head and it doesn't affect a cranial nerve and doesn't affect the pons of the brainstem. It's I, I can't imagine it happening. <laughs> I'll pass it on to them, but but they, but just to be clear, I agree with that. I've mentioned it myself, but that doesn't doesn't establish that that's the mechanism of action. And and. Okay, but, but that's different than what you presented. That's what, what I'm saying. A hypothesis is a hypothesis, and you can test it, and if you can demonstrate it's activating it, so then... Yeah, no, no, it, look, I, I'm not, this is not, not a game, right? It, it's, a, it's not just a hypothesis. It's a testable one if one wants to, and that's the point I was trying to make. If you want to establish that that's the mechanism, I think one needs to show not only that it engages, but that it accounts for enough of the clinical outcome. And that's a different type of research than what you present. I'm actually just going to open it up to audience questions real quick. <laughs> but I was going to say something. I've been around for a while, uh, and, and I'm older than some of you folks. Um, I, I got my, what was 45-year pin at... Uh, MGH uh, in October. Uh, I studied in D.O. Hebb's department at McGill University before I was a psychiatric resident and uh, before I did my medicine at Hopkins and worked in the United States Navy. I cannot think of any time in the history of neuroscience, psychology, and psychiatry, that there has not been a new approach to neurological stimulation. One of the first observations that preceded the development of psychotropic medications, which have their very significant limits, but the 30% number uh, is very, very, that you had up before is similar to what you see with the, uh, the extraordinary number of psychotropics that come along uh, in terms of efficacy. There was some serendipity in, in looking at people on the, in sanitaria for tuberculosis, <clears throat> and remarkably some of these people were, were doing pretty well in terms of their mood and, and uh, this led to the development of monoamine, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. 
Psychotropics stimulate the brain. When I do hypnosis with people, it stimulates the brain. When I talk to people in my office or here in this room, I'm stimulating your brains. Uh, if you go to the media lab at MIT and speak to Neil Grossman, who's uh, leaving for King's College, and, and uh, the other folks over there, Dr. Boyden, they've been looking at a milliamp of current and, and applying it to certain parts of brain. You can do it with the lateral, apparently more uh, effective than the medial, uh, uh, sorry, the left versus the right uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And you can do some wonderful things in terms of attention and mood and arousal. Uh, and there's been some very significant uh, information about that. The military is very interested in, 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 uh, in, in arousal and, and affecting neural currents in the brain. And I remember reading some years ago that the DOD at some point is interested in having chips that can be placed in the brain that will help pilots fly airplanes from the ground. I, I hope that someday we'll be able to do that uh, to supplement loss of memory in humans. The information here seems so terribly disorganized. And I think one has to be very, very, very cautious about another uh, among the extraordinary abundance of fads that people get very excited about. And one needs to be very, very specific and not think that there haven't been advances in science and that now this great wonder has come, come along that supersedes everything else when it hasn't been thoroughly researched. Uh, I think it's very stimulating. I want to read about your company. I want to read about the Cochrane reports. They do wonderful analyses. I want to see what they're coming up with. But uh, there is a lot to learn here. Thanks very much. Just a, a very quick question for Dr. Tyler. So you presented under safety um, TDCS versus your modification of it versus sham. And then efficacy, you showed your modification versus sham. Where did TDCS fit? In terms of efficacy, so the uh, it was in the middle. And the way we assessed efficacy was with a um, it's a state trait anxiety inventory. Um, stay six, it's an abbreviated form, and we looked at different scores. And TDCS was <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it was more towards sham than it was towards the our our neurosignaling approach. When we released the data later this week or the week after, we're first going to describe the safety and tolerability, and there will be another follow-on paper after that describing the ep efficacy comparing sham TDCS and, and TPCS. There is a sham effect. You do see a sham effect across six weeks, right? Like people, I think what happens is people tend to become more relaxed in the environment. They become more comfortable and, they, you know, there's a reduction of the state anxiety. I, I do think, though, that one of the problems with dealing with this area is a lot of the efficacy testing is testing in laboratory conditions. Efficacy is defined in particularly narrow ways that are not necessarily real world relevant. So the Stroop test, Stroop test has been around for a long time. It's useful for some things. Is it really what students want to know about in terms of are they going to be able to study better or not? A lot of the Adderall work has this problem too. They do short term cognitive tests like how many random numbers can you keep in your head at various times. But the kids taking it want to focus better for the space of 12 hours in terms of studying for the test or writing their exams. That's a lot harder to study. Uh, but I think that may, might be a more relevant kind of efficacy study. If I could, the IRB wouldn't let me. I'd take 200 Stanford undergrads and give half of them Adderall and half of them placebo, or half of them uh, think and half of them placebo, and follow them for a year and see how their grades changed. The IRB won't let me do that. I, I do think you know, moving from efficacy as measured in a lab context to efficacy in the real world, it's going to be a challenge. So just to comment on that, so we started doing a series of alpha studies and beta studies, and we, we thought that we would have a more difficult time getting good efficacy effects in the real world. So what we saw in the lab, we then translated to the real world. 
And we ran a series of studies around the holidays. We brought people in and we said, you know, you're stressed around Thanksgiving and Christmas. We'd like, or Hanukkah, whatever, you get around your family. We'd like you to use this device. We took people who went on first dates. There's usually a lot of anxiety associated with first dates. We had people who, before they had public speaking engagements, on and on and on. And what we found was that the efficacy was actually greater in the real world when there was a need to reduce sympathetic activity versus in an artificial environment in the laboratory where sympathetic tone may be very low. And, and I wasn't really criticizing your overall energy versus calm and asking patients as well as the galvanic skin response and so on. It was when you hit, went to the cognitive tests you did, yeah, right. I think those are a bit artificial. I, I don't want us to monopolize, so, so I'll, I'll make it very short. But but the, in, but again, I think the critical thing in in that setting is is what is really your control, and and the, and perhaps eventually you can expand more because when when you said you spent a lot of time as a company sort of defining how to best uh, optimize the waves to go beyond the placebo, uh, the sham effect, that that you know. That, you, that sounds alarms in me, right? In terms of what what exactly are you talking about about doing, um, and and yet there are there are fairly straightforward sort of control conditions that one can imagine, right? If you really believe that the waves, whatever they are, um, are different for in the pattern for the calm versus the energy, you can just flip them and and uh, and give the same instruction and actually see whether indeed there is a different effect or, 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 on. A, Okay, you didn't present that. So, uh, but but the, um, so so I think there are there are things that that make it hard to capture in real life. That obviously is what we all want to do: is make a difference in in people's life, be it patients or, or otherwise. Uh, but uh, but there are reasons why it's difficult to do real life experimentation, which eventually will be overcome with the technology. But but uh, sorry. So I want to thank the three of you for coming here. You represent very different pieces of the spectrum of this debate. Um, just three quick observations. One is that so each of us has a different identity. Some of us have dual identities. You know, I'm a physician, but I'm a neuroscientist. So I accept the fact that every day I see people for whom we have inadequate therapies, inadequate treatments. It helps to do something, do no harm. So I think Pasqualeone falls into that perfectly. With TMS is a kinder and gentler ECT, bring it on. It may say nothing about how the brain works, or it may be the holy grail. And you know, none of us are smart enough to know that right now. It's understandable that sometimes these two sorts of things want to get confused, right? Digoxin was used since the 1700s in medicine. It was 200 years before anybody had any idea what the molecular mechanism was. And probably the Greeks used it because they knew everything. So. so it's important to sort of think about these different pieces of ourselves when we have these conversations. My first observation. Second is about enhancement. I really appreciate Professor Greeley's really interesting talk. Enhancement is a tricky thing. Yes, we've always been enhancers, but there's no guarantee that the enhancement doesn't end in a species-ending apocalyptic nightmare, right? True. <laughs> I mean, I'm, climate, I'm, climate I'm willing change. to bet that in 11 billion years, we right. will not be here. Right. Cli right. So it's always safe in the short run, but that's my point, right? Climate change, who knows? That was enhancement, carbon. Who, ends, who knows where it ends? And that relates to my third point. You know, are we going to be like the surgeons or the geneticists? The surgeons have done procedures for years, some of which ended up being completely counterproductive, killing their patients, uh, making mortality worse. They, but they had sort of evidence-based medicine forced upon them in the last two decades. And so they've adapted. Uh, the geneticists, their science is way ahead of where our science is. I mean, we're idiots about the brain compared to them. We really are. But they've been thinking about the ethical issues from the very beginning. They've actually sort of thought about what experiments we can do, what experiments we can't do, where does this head? It's not perfect, right? There are people in Japan doing stuff that jumps over all of the ethical things. But I think it's worth thinking about, you know, which path do we want to follow? The surgeons, and with all due respect, the device people, I think, are more soulmates 
um, you know, let's get it out there, let's see what happens. I think, you know, you're more in the traditional um, uh, trying to heal model. But I, I, I'm really worried if we don't start thinking about, the geneticists have really thought about this, and they are so far ahead. We have no idea about what the underlying mechanism of consciousness is, really. It'd be a century, probably. Neuroscientists, we love to be arrogant. I'm a neuroscientist. We love to be arrogant. We love to be immodest. There's no Watson. There's no Rosalind Franklin. There's no Crick. Our metaphors are pre-Newtonian, right? There's no quantum phenomena that's modable in the brain. We got to be really modest. <laughs> So I'll just say the International Neuroethics Society is not only helping support the webcast of this, but it's a place where scientists, non-scientists, lawyers, ethicists, individual, you know, regular people try to come together to worry about these kinds of issues, and our annual membership is cheap. That's my conflict of interest. But I, I do think the geneticists, to some extent, had the ethics thrust upon them, in part because the politics were really ugly, and Jim Watson who is many things, is also smart, and he basically bribed the ethicists with 5% of their budget. And it worked in terms of limiting the political pushback against genetics research, but it also worked in terms of creating a whole bunch of people who are scientifically sophisticated but ethically sophisticated and willing to examine these things well, I think neuroscience needs that. I've been arguing that with uh, Tom Insel uh, for a while. The Brain Initiative is a great, the US Brain Initiative as opposed to the Harvard Brain Initiative. They're both uh, a great way to kind of make that happen, and it might. But if any of you have influence with Tom, push. Well, I was just going to say one of the things we've done as a company, and I'm not going to name names, but we have actually sponsored some unrestricted educational grants to look at ethics. And I've actually reached out to Professor Greeley to get advice from him so we can understand, understand the landscape, the future Although hurdles. That we're, any money from. No. <laughs> but we want to understand the landscape. What are the issues, right? Like, and, and we're doing that because we are trying to act as responsibly as a company as we can, right? I don't, we're not geneticists. We're not at that level yet because I don't think we understand the problems that we're going to face in the next 10 years, right? What are the imbalances that this is going to cause? Genetics is a little more black and white, right? Like, people understand what some of the issues are, right? Cloning humans, people say, no, you shouldn't do it. I, I don't think we can do it yet, right? Like, can we make people, you know, five times smarter than they are today? Some people in the neuromodulation world would want you to believe that. I don't think we're there. I don't think we can do that, right? So I think that it's, it's something we're going to have to continue to monitor for quite some time. But we are paying attention. Um, I just wanted to, to echo the, the point of the, the importance of the different constituencies uh, actively up front and early uh, becoming engaged in the in the ethical aspects of, of this uh, and, and I think we you know neuro simulation brain simulation neuromodulation has a long history and and it's a colorful one right uh, where uh, Rodriguez Delgado Hunt or many others did all kinds of remarkable things and and uh, that led to some insights and some remarkable derailments uh, to the to the tune of the call for a psycho civilized society uh, so uh, which meant inserting electrodes so that we might in fact uh, guide appropriately uh, people or um, treatment trials of stimulating specific brain structures while exposing people to uh, prostitutes so as to overcome their homosexuality right and and, the, and in the face of that history i think we have to do better and, you know, th th this is in part because of the fact that hopefully humans have some limited, albeit real, possibility of learning from history, and this is one where we have to. And the second is because ethics has come a long way and is very engaged in, in, in this and very willing to, to help think through. But I think the last one is because the availability, the relatively ease of these techniques will confront us with the reality that it is being used widely and increasingly so and, and unless we address the ethics of it broadly with all the constituencies we risk losing um, historical grounds just like we did with neuromodulation in the 60s. 
So I think we actually have to wrap up there. Um, we have a dinner where we're going to continue this conversation in an informal setting. If anyone's worried that the discussion has been too cordial thus far.